Okay, so the uh, the title of, of this particular talk is Why Capitalism Needs Losses Too. And you know, this is something that I think even a lot of big fans of the free market, a trap they fall into, where you know, when we're de defending capitalism and the way that free market laissez-faire economies work, there is this tendency where we, we just focus on profits and we say that, oh, you know, this, this is great, the entrepreneur is uh, profitable and that's sort of a noble thing, again, if, if, if he's, he or she is earning it uh, through voluntary market transactions and not by, as Peter talked about, running to the government and getting special favors and privileges. And, and that's certainly true, and that's, that's an important component of the story, but we, we don't describe the market economy as a profit system, it's one way of describing it as a profit and loss system, and it's important to focus on the flip side, because then that, in a sense, underscores what it is that, pr that profits do, right? So if you understand what a, what a loss is and why that's undesirable, then that sheds more light on why a profit, per se, is a good thing and why you want to encourage that. Now, uh, to, and, and so going along with that, mere, not merely just looking at the government sort of crippling the, the earning of profits, and, and the profits in the, in the good sense, and why that could be a bad thing. So just to, to give you an example of what I'm talking about, if the government has what's called an, an excess profits tax, okay, so some of you may be familiar with that term, and that's something that politicians a lot of times will recommend. And on the face of it, it seems like, well, how could that be a bad thing, right? That if, if they need to raise money somehow, an excess profits tax. And notice they put that, that word excess in there to make it look like, you know, someone who's earning more profits than he really even needs. You know, so who could be against an excess profits tax? Well, as an economist, you can walk through the logic of, of why that's not a good thing, or at least what the downsides would be to that. And it goes back to the things that Peter and I have been talking about. So re remember, how do you earn profits? It's when you forecast the future better than other people. And I may have given you the impression that the successful entrepreneur you know, knows it's going to happen. But of course, in the real world, nobody knows the future for sure. They could be wrong. And so if you're going to be an entrepreneur and take a, a risky venture, if you're going to do something, put up your money or your shareholders' money, you're going to borrow money from people in the bond market or whatever, and take a, a, a chance on something, it, it could go right and it could blow up in your face, right? And so if the government comes in now and, and says we're going to have a very high tax rate on certain activities that we're going to classify as the earning of excess profits, it's not correct to think, well, in the grand scheme, that's not going to hurt anything because if somebody makes a million dollars off of something and he only gets to keep half of it, well, he still made 500,000, so he's still gonna do it. No one's gonna turn away $500,000, right? And that's, that's the way some people think about it. And even uh, if you're familiar with Warren Buffett, you know, he makes jokes about that in front of the press or whatever to, to make it look like he's just an average guy like you or me, uh, saying things about, you know, oh, come on, I've never looked at a business deal and thought I was gonna earn 18%, but then because of taxes, I'm gonna earn 14% or whatever, and so I walk away. But you're not guaranteed you're going to earn 18, 18%, right? You might lose a bunch of money, too. And so that's, and, and he knows that. That means I think that he's, he's being coy there with, the, with his audience. And so that's the problem. Just to give you a concrete example, I mean, suppose there were, you know, a pharmaceutical company that had millions of dollars in its research budget, and it had, you know, and it realized, okay, we're going to fund research for 15 different types of drugs to, to fight certain diseases, treat certain illnesses or so forth, and maybe even develop a cure for them. And we're going to spend, I'm just obviously making up numbers here, we're going to spend $200,000 on each one. And you know, we, we think that one of them might hit. Probably most of them are going to be duds, and we're, we're just going to spend that money and get nothing back for it. But one of them, we might hit a home run. And on that one, once we get the thing up and running, and we're selling it in the marketplace, you know, if you just looked at our investment in that one particular drug and the rate of return on our investment, it would be huge. And so if the government comes along then and sees that and then taxes us and says, you don't need to be earning that much. All you need to earn is 15% on your capital, and that's plenty, and that should be enough to encourage you to develop drugs. Well, you'd realize, well, that, that wouldn't be the right way to look at it. If they thought going into it that if any of these takes off and we hit a home run on it, then the government's only going to let us keep a little bit. Well, then the whole research budget as a whole now is cast into doubt, and maybe we don't want to do that. We don't want to put up millions of dollars because we know even if, it, if one of them does hit, you know, pay off, 
we're not going to get to keep that. All right, so that's just one example. And of course, those numbers might not be realistic, but I just want to get you to see uh, how it can be that the government coming in and putting in a so-called excess profits tax would cripple things. Okay, but going back to what I said at the beginning of this second talk, I don't want you merely to focus on that kind of thing. It's not simply that the government distorts the market and the operation of the price system if it sort of mutes uh, successes, right? If it doesn't let you keep what you've earned in terms of profit, yes, that deadens your incentive to go do the right thing and to, and to stick to something that's safer, all right? So that's, that's one aspect. But let's also not forget that the government does the opposite. They come in very often and they subsidize losses. So you get the worst of both worlds, that they're taking away what the market normally would give as a reward, if that's the way you want to think about it, to people who see the future better than others. And at the same time, the government comes in and compensates people and sort of uh, cushions the blow when they really screw up and then the, and, and takes the, the pain away from that. And so it takes away the fear of doing something silly as well. And that's also not the right signal you want to give. So in terms of what's the right balance between those things, well, I think Peter and I would certainly say, and many other Austrian economists, that the, the right mixture of the possibility of gain, but also the worry and the fear of a giant loss, and how do you adjust your behavior accordingly, is exactly what the market gives you, and let people in the market determine what the appropriate uh, degree of risk-taking ought to be. So it's not that we want to encourage people to be risky, but we also don't want to discourage them either. Let people judge for themselves whether a certain uh, gamble, if you will, is justified or not. Now, let me take a step back here and just give you some examples, historical examples, because I think even a lot of us, we might not realize how things in the market, it's not obvious. We can see something in retrospect, a very successful corporation, certain business venture, certain product innovation, and it's, oh yeah, of course, and then someone who's making millions of dollars because of that, or the shareholders who got lucky, and, and people can say, well, you know, why, why should they have that sort of uh, advantage over the rest of us? And I think part of what's happening, the reason people think like that, is they don't realize how often even big businesses make mistakes. They don't realize that, you know, um, you know why is it that a, a corporation wants to bring in a CEO to do a certain thing, and a lot of times it's because they think this person has a vision and we want someone to come in and make these decisions. So my point is, it's not just clockwork. It's not just going in and punching a clock and everyone just goes about their daily business and that's what a giant corporation does. No, there have to be people at the helm who make decisions about what, what, what's our new product line gonna be? You know, do we wanna push our engineers and our production staff to get this thing out in next quarter or do we wanna just you know, do more internal testing to make sure that, you know, the quality assurance is there, but then release it the quarter after, right? And so this is a, a trade-off they face. And as Peter was mentioning, that, you know, there's no obvious answer to that. You got to leave that up to people in the marketplace and they might make the, the wrong decision. So, I mean, that's, you know, if you wonder sometimes too, like how come when software comes out and it's all buggy, the first version, and then in the subsequent versions, they fix it. Sometimes you might wonder, why don't they just get it right the first time? And the answer is, well, because then they would never release new software, right? You, there could always be something wrong with it. And you just, at some point, on the margin, as economists would say, delaying further is not worth it, that it makes more sense to release the thing knowing full well it's going to get out there, your, your customers are going to be using it, and they're going to start complaining. And then you're going to have to start working on a fix for, you know, the next version or a quick patch if it's really a serious problem, that sort of thing. All right, so that's the constant trade-off that there is. Just to give you some uh, historical examples, so your parents are, will recognize some of these, but then later I'll, I'll give you ones that are perhaps more relevant to the, to the students here. So uh, there was famously this line of cars called the Edsel that was a big flop, all right? And this was not some you know, podunk little corporation. It was a giant corporation released this new thing. They thought it was gonna work. If it had been a home run, you know, they would have said the people involved were geniuses, but it was a flop, and so now that's sort of just like a, a, a joke. The, the Beatles, right, the, the musical band, The Beatles, you guys are familiar with them, right? You guys heard of the Beatles? Okay, I gotta check. Um, they, uh, 
their first, you know, they went to a record before they were famous. They went to and did an audition for a record label to try to sign them, and they turned them down. The record label said, no, you know, your guitar, that sound that we think is on the way out. Thanks for coming in. I mean, can you imagine if you were the people involved in that decision when the Beatles went on to become, you know, the biggest band in human history, and then somebody at a record company turned them down. They had the chance to sign them. The Beatles would have been their band, and they said, nah, we're not interested. All right? Uh, there was something called, you guys might not, you, you guys familiar with the new Coke? You guys remember that? Okay. So there, I, I actually never knew the, the specifics of that. So what happens, you know, Coke unveiled this thing they called the new Coke, and then they just quickly got rid of it, and, you know, we don't, we don't ever speak of that again. And what happened was, and I didn't know this until recently, I was just reading this book about various, you know, these sort of marketing flops and things like that. And what happened is, apparently they had done a bunch of taste testing. And in small doses, you know, just given consumers, and it was, you know, and they, they were scientific about it, right? They didn't want to make a, a dumb decision. They had lots of millions of dollars at risk. Um, you know, so they, they did all the proper double blind studies. And so, in other words, you know, they didn't, uh, they made it sure that the people didn't know what they were drinking. And so they honestly were reporting. And this, they tinkered with the formula and the sugar content, whatever, from the, from the old original Coke to what they were calling the new Coke. And it was just beating the pants off of Pepsi, right? And all these blind taste tests. And so they were, they're, you know, their marketing guys were sure. They said, this thing is going to be awesome. And so let's build a campaign. Let's call it the new Coke to make sure people distinguish. And they realized this is a new thing. It tastes even better than the old. And they went through. And then what happened is people started just... It wasn't selling, and, and, and they figured out what the problem was. If you're just having a little sip, you want it to be sweeter, right? And so drinking it, you know, just a little sip at a time, the thing that's sweeter, just people said, I like that better. But if you're drinking a whole can, that after a while gets overwhelming, and you don't want that, right? And so, you know, if you just think about, like, original classic Coke, it's not as sweet as some other types of drinks, but, you know, if you want to drink a whole can of something, Coke's pretty good. I'm not getting paid by Coke, by the way, but if they want to send me, you guys want to send me a check if you're watching this online, feel free. Um, okay, so you understand, so that was the mistake that they made, that they, they incorrectly extrapolated from the results of these blind taste tests to thinking, we sell this thing in terms of six packs and two liters, it's going to fly off the shelves, and they, they, they made the mistake. It was, an honest, it was obviously an honest mistake. They, it wasn't in their interest to lose millions of dollars, or I don't know how much they lost, but it was certainly embarrassing, and they quickly recovered. Okay, so the, the point of that one is just to show you, you might think that, oh, Coca-Cola is this giant behemoth. They have all this ad, you know, these marketing people, that they can do whatever they want. And the consumers are helpless because you go to the store and there's Coke, Coke, Coke all in your face. Well, no, in a market economy, a, a corporation can't force you to buy anything. Ultimately, it's up to the consumer and you can do what you want with your money. And it's true with clever marketing and they pay sports stars or whatever to do things and you you know, beer commercials make it look like, oh, you just, you want to start a party, just pop open one of our drinks, and all of a sudden, you know, people are dancing in your living room, and <laughs> I, it doesn't work, by the way, just so you guys know. Um, but the point is, you, everyone can do that, and, and Mises has made that point, too, in his writings. He said that you can't, that a bad pr product or a good product, you know, they both have those means at their disposal, and so in the long run, a product that really just isn't good and consumers don't like, you're not going to trick them into consistently buying it from you time and again. And also the, the companies that make genuinely good products, they can also hire, you know, the spokesmodels to come in or to get Michael Jordan to give it an endorsement or whatever. And so those things should wash out and then you would think the thing that in the long run is actually the superior product is going to win out. All right, so that's just another example. One uh, more recently, similar to the Beatles fiasco, uh, I don't know the exact number, but J.K. Rowling, you know, the author of Harry Potter, uh, she apparently sent that manuscript to dozens, I believe, uh, you know, publishers and agents or whatever, and they all just, nope, nope, nope. You get, you get rejection after rejection until finally somebody gave it a shot, and then we all know what happened there. I mean, she's incredibly wealthy. Um, she, she could be, I don't know, is she a billionaire? Does anybody know? Yeah. She's certainly a hundreds of millionaire. I don't know if she's a Okay. So... And that's in pounds, so that's really, that's saying something, right? <laughs> okay, so, so what the, what's the point? The point is go out and write a novel and just keep shipping it to people until it hits. No, the, the, the point is that people make mistakes, people in you know, the business world, and so it, it's not obvious what the right thing to do is. 
And uh, you, you need to understand it. And this ties back into what I was saying about Mises' critique of the socialists. Mises pointed out that he said that part of the problem here is when these guys, referring to the socialist academics, when they think of what it is that happens in a market and what it is that the leaders of a company do, he said they're, they're actually not thinking of the entrepreneur. They're thinking of the manager. They're thinking of somebody who walks in, has his daily routine already structured, who knows you know, what, what are we doing today? Oh, we're making, uh, you know, drill presses or something. Like he goes to a factory and he's a mid-level manager and he's part of a factory that cranks out drill presses. They know who their customers are and he comes in and just sits down and has the figures and then just tweaks little things and, oh, gee, if some, you know, if John didn't show up for, for his shift, we give him a warning. If he doesn't come again, we fire him and we replace him. And it's a very narrowly constructed thing. We know what we're producing. We know that the factory is supposed to be there, and the question is just, oh, if the electricity bill rises, maybe we should change our operations a little bit and use less electricity and use more of something else. Okay, but it, you're just making little tweaks within the parameters that are established. And Mises' point is, in a market economy, somebody had to make the decision that we're gonna get into the business of making drill presses. Someone had to decide, investors had to be willing to give money to build the factory where it happens to be. It could have been a shopping mall. Right? It's, not, it's not set in stone. It's not a knowledge that we get from nature that says there should be a drill press factory right here. It could have been a parking lot. It could have been a shopping mall. It could have been something else, a hospital. Right? So somebody has to make those decisions or some group of people. And Mises' point was that's the important thing that profits and losses do in a capitalist market economy is they guide people in those decisions. And it's precisely that that the central planners in a socialist framework wouldn't be able to do. So it's true, Mises pointed out, that on the, uh, the eve of such a transition, right, if, if there was a revolution or just a peaceful uh, democratic thing, and we all of a sudden had a socialist group put into power, they could just continue to do things the way that had been done under capitalism. And so, you know, if the, if the revolution happens on a Tuesday, Wednesday, they could just say to everyone, just keep doing what you were doing yesterday. Just go back to work wherever you were, and then we'll just start tinkering with the plan. But the point is, over time, you know, the, the relevance of what the market had been doing on that Tuesday under capitalism and then the transition occurred, that relevance would die off over time. And so 20 years out in the future, the socialists really would have no idea of, gee, what would the market economy have been doing with this, in this situation? And they would have to sort of from scratch be deciding, what do we do with our resources here? What do we t where do we tell these workers to go? What should they make? You know, this plot of land right here, should there be a hospital or should there be a factory cranking out drill presses? And again, the point is those are not merely technological questions. They couldn't just ask their engineers and their chemists and their physicists, tell us everything you know, and then we'll, the answer will pop out because it, it involves consumers valuing things. And that's a, that's a crucial part of the equation. And that's precisely what they wouldn't have without something analogous to what the market economy is, the profit and loss system. Okay, uh, let me talk a little bit about um, a specific example of how the government can come in and uh, subsidize losses and sort of chop the, knee, chop the market economy off of the knees in terms of the normal operation of the profit and loss mechanism. So specifically, it's, I want to talk about TARP, uh, the Troubled Asset Relief Program. You guys, do you at least, are you fam vaguely familiar with what that is or was? Okay. So um, this was back in the, and I like talking about this also because this happened under the, the Bush administration is when this thing went through. And so what happens is sort of hazard of, of my occupation is if, if there's a Democrat in the White House and you write stuff against the federal government, you get all kinds of emails you know, saying, where were you when you know, George Bush was in power? And, was, and anyway, I can send them articles of me criticizing George Bush. And I said, I was right here. You know, that's, that's where it was. And please send your contributions to the Mises Institute. But, um, uh, and, and then by the same token, of course, when George Bush was in power and I would write something critical of the federal government intervening in the market economy, I'd get all these you know, things, you know, what you liberal lovers don't, don't realize is such and such, and you know, again. So uh, what happened under the, the Bush administration was, remember, there was this big housing bubble, this big boom in certain asset prices and the collapse, and then a lot of uh, financial institutions if the government and the Federal Reserve had just stayed, stepped back and done nothing, would have gone under. 
and people were telling us, oh, that's, that would be the end of the world or the end of the financial world. We couldn't possibly contemplate that horrible outcome. And so the federal government came in and effectively nationalized a lot of these banks in a move that if some Latin American dictator had done it, you know, the American public would have easily been persuaded that that was fascism or socialism or something. But since it was the free market Bush administration, it was a necessary move, uh, according to what we were told. So whether, you know, and a lot of people didn't like that because of the unfairness of it all, right? That here we have all these millions of homeowners who are underwater, people are getting foreclosed on, and then a lot of the people who lost billions of dollars in terms of their bad investment decisions, they get bailed out, either from the federal government or the Federal Reserve, sort of a backdoor channel. So yeah, of course, just in terms of common sense and our everyday notions of morality, that, that seems kind of unfair. But in terms of just the operation of a market economy and just not being, not making a moral judgment one way or the other, just being neutral about it, that is, is bad or because it cripples the ability of the economy to allocate resources effectively. So, you know, what, what is the argument in favor of unfettered financial markets where we don't have the government coming in and regulating everybody and telling them, uh, you know, these are the capital requirements you need. If, if you want to do certain investments, the government's going to have a list of guidelines for what's safe and what isn't. As free market economists, you know, we're not in favor of that. We don't want the government micromanaging investment decisions. We don't want the government telling firms, this is what you can do with your money and this is what you can't do. But the only way that works is if a, when a firm screws up, they're allowed to fail. Right? That, that, that model doesn't work if you reward profits by letting people keep a bunch of money, but then if it blows up in their face, you come in and bail them out with taxpayer, taxpayer money or when the Fed does it basically with everybody who, who uses US dollars with their wealth because by printing more money, it dilutes what everyone else is holding. Okay, so, so that's, um, that's the, the other side of that argument. So it's not simply just the sort of populist anger that's justifiable about why is Wall Street getting bailed out when everybody, you know, ordinary folks are getting laid off and getting foreclosed on. And that's certainly a legitimate gripe. But beyond that, it's that it's, it's difficult to say the free market can work when they don't uh, allow losses to do what losses are supposed to do in a, in a market economy. And it's sort of ironic because the, the interventionists who you know, were for TARP, they, they cited the whole episode as an example of why, see, we can't have just unfettered markets because look what happened. But the way, you know, that, that's sort of odd because the, the business people involved many of them knew or at least strongly suspected that if things ever really did get bad, the Fed would come in and rescue us. And so that's why they were during the heady days of the boom period, like 2003 to 2006, when a lot of these firms were making a bunch of money as housing prices kept going up and the executives were all making hundreds of thousands or even millions of dollars in bonuses, it was easy for them to sort of overlook the fact that, well, you know, what if, what if housing prices just collapsed? Wouldn't we be in trouble that maybe we want to pull back and not be so aggressive? And it was quite rational for them to think, well, if that were to happen, you know, the Fed's not going to just sit back and let, and, and let the whole financial sector go down. That would be crazy. And they were right in thinking that. Uh, now, just to give a little more flavor to that, let me mention, I, I did after that, you know, after the, the blow up and everything, I, I called, called some, some people, people I talked to, to uh, analysts who worked at... Uh, in ratings agencies, you know, like Moody's and Fitch and Standard & Poor, because there was a lot going on there. So I, I'm certainly, my point is not to say the everyone in the free market or in the market economy is just a, a bunch of angels fluttering around and then the government came in and screwed everything up and that's why we had the housing boom and bust. That's not what I'm saying. There certainly were greedy people who were myopic and made what in retrospect were awful decisions. But again, the point is the market economy doesn't, require having flawless individuals to work. What, what you need though is accountability where, yeah, if people make the right call, then they earn profits and get to keep it. Whereas if they make a horrible decision and they earn, suffer losses, well, you have to let that result stand as well. If you sort of nullify that result, well, then that skews things and leads to situations like we saw. So uh, there were firms financial institutions that were less aggressive during the housing bubble, where their internal analysts or just their CEO or whoever said, you know, these, these home prices are ridiculous. This, this can't last. We're not going to get into this as heavily as some of our competitors. 
And in a market economy, what would have happened is they would have ultimately been justified. So yes, their returns that they reported to their shareholders during those housing boom years would have been less impressive than their competitors, but they could have you know, told their investors and their, their clients, just stick with us. We think that this is a mirage and trust us, you know, you'll be glad when the, when the uh, roof caves in on these other guys, you'll be glad you stuck with us. Whereas now they, they can't say that as much because the other people uh, you know, were, were partially rescued. So w what happened, just to f fill you in a little bit on the details of that, is there was partly an intellectual mistake. Like I said, I've, I've talked to some of these guys and they said partly the, the problem was these, these things that were called derivatives um, that were based on, it was basically you take a little bit of, of thousands of different mortgages from around the country and put them in this one thing and so then all the, the homeowners would make their mortgage payments every month. They would all flow into this thing. And then you'd sell off pieces of this to various investors. And so depending on the rules of who gets to dip into that pool of money first, those things appear to be very safe. Like if you were drawn from the very bottom, you know, if you were an investor who bought a slice of this pool that was getting funneled by thousands of mortgages from around the country, the idea was in order for me to, not, to miss out on my payments, and that's what I'm paying for right now is the right to earn this flow of payments. It would take, you know, homeowners from across the country would have to start defaulting. And so the bottom of that thing was very safe, whereas the top piece of that pool was very risky, and that's how they were priced accordingly. So that was, that was what happened. That was part of the intellectual um, mistake that these guys at these rating agencies, you know, they had fancy computer models, and the one guy was telling me on the phone, this, was, this would be like in 2000, middle of 2009, I was talking to him, asking him, you know, what happened? Like, did, did you guys know there was going to be a blow up but thought you'd get bailed out? Because that seems kind of implausible. And he said, no, it wasn't so much that, but it was more that these things were so complicated, barely anybody understood them. You know, we had a bunch of physicists down the hall and they built the computer models and they knew how the things worked and the rest of us didn't really even know how they worked. And so that was a problem. And specifically, the computer models assumed that all real estate was local. So they, th so yes, the, the computers knew home prices in Tallahassee, Florida could go down 10% in a year. They knew that was possible. And they had, you know, they looked historically at movements in prices to figure out what's the chance of that happening. And they knew the same thing could happen in Vegas and the same thing could happen in Sacramento. But they thought those would all be independent events, statistically. So they thought, if we're building this derivative product from mortgages all over the country and putting them in this one pool, the chance of them all dropping, all those real estate markets going down 10% one year, is infinitesimal. That's like an event that'll happen once every million years. So that was the intellectual mistake. So the point is, you know, is that good or bad? In retrospect, we can say, oh, those idiots. But at the time, you know, they thought this is inconceivable that the home prices across the country would all drop simultaneously. And so there, there's no, you know, beforehand, you wouldn't know what's right or wrong. But the point is, in retrospect, well, they were clearly wrong. And so in a market economy with genuine profit and loss, where the government and Fed don't bail people out, those people would have all gone out of business or they would have suffered greatly and those ratings agencies would have taken a huge hit in their credibility and we would now probably be you know, turning to other ratings agencies. But we can't because those are ones are locked in based on government regulations that say if you're a financial institution, you need your bonds to be rated AAA by so-and-so ratings agencies and those big ones are listed, right? You can't get your, your, your brother-in-law to say, yep, your bonds are AAA by me, go ahead. That, that doesn't count. Right, so I'm just saying all, a lot of these things that people, these knee-jerk reactions, you, you guys, Peter Klein and Murph, you guys are nuts. Look at what the market did for us. Well, look at all the host of government regulations that cripple and, and neuter the sorts of mechanisms we're talking about. So again, you, you gotta have a balanced approach. We're not saying somebody who earns profits per se is necessarily a good guy because there's all sorts of interventions, but it's important to realize the function of profits and losses in a genuine market economy. Okay, so now we'll open up to the general Q&A. Thanks.